What's up, guys? David Mize here. Thanks for watching Mize Formula. I've been trying to do weekly updates, if not daily updates. I appreciate you guys subscribing, commenting. Um, and so today, I'm going to do another video. I'd like to talk about the differences between water-to-air intercooling and air-to-air intercooling. Um, what are the significant differences between the two? And why do we choose one over the other? And what are some of the misconceptions behind them? And what are we running on this RX-7? So first of all, before we get to air-to-air -to -air versus water-to-air, let's talk about what is an intercooler to begin with. Okay, so you got a compressor right here. All right, this is a turbocharger. For those of you that don't know, okay, this is a turbocharger. It uses exhaust energy. So the exhaust exits the exhaust manifold, travels up into the turbo. It spins this turbine wheel on the backside, which spins this compressor in the front here. And this compressor is going to suck in air from the atmosphere outside, which let's say the ambient temperature is 70, 80 degrees, whatever it is, where you live. It's going to suck that air in and it's going to compress it. And by compressing it, we're gaining more oxygen in the intake going into the motor, all right? Because we're grabbing more air, we're pressurizing it into a smaller space, and we're forcing it into the engine, which is going to give us more oxygen, which is going to allow us to make more horsepower, okay? That's how a turbocharger works. The more pressure, the more oxygen, generally, okay? And that's what you call boost. So, you know, 14 pounds of boost is essentially double the atmospheric pressure that we live in. So you're going to get almost double the amount of oxygen. But it's not quite that way. You have a little bit of loss in efficiency. And the reason that there's an efficiency loss is because any time that you put anything under pressure, there's going to be an accompanying amount of temperature increase that comes along with that pressurization. Okay, So when this turbocharger compresses that 80 degree air, by the time it hits 14, 15 pounds of boost and you're sitting there on the throttle, that air is going to increase in temperature to potentially 120, 30, 40, 50, maybe 200 degrees. Okay. Now, what are the drawbacks to having that increase in air that comes along with compressing the boost? Okay. The drawbacks to that increase in air temperature are two things. One, the potential of reaching the flash point of your fuel. So if you're running 91, 93 octane, whatever it is, okay, and you're putting that pressurized hot air into the motor, depending on the timing that the motor's running and the compression ratio that your motor is running, you could run the risk, which is highly probable at high boost levels, of causing that fuel to auto ignite, meaning it's going to be just like a diesel engine. It's going to explode from pressure alone, from the heat and the temperature alone from the boost you're going to cause that fuel to ignite and you're going to blow your motor to smithereens. Okay. So you have to keep that intake air as cool as possible. Now drawback number two is that when the air gets hotter, okay, as the heat increases, the density of the oxygen molecules begins to drop. You, you have less dense oxygen inside this charge. Okay. So 14 pounds of air, 14 pounds of boosted air going into the motor at 30 degrees Fahrenheit has a hell of a lot more oxygen in it, okay, because the molecules are closely compressed and compacted, okay, you're able to cram more oxygen in there at a colder temperature versus 200 degree air at 15 pounds of boost has a lot less oxygen in it, okay, so the cooler the air, the more oxygen, the more power, and the less chances of detonating the engine, okay, so that's what you want to do, right? You want to make the air intake charge temperatures as cool as possible, okay? So that is what an intercooler does. An intercooler is responsible for cooling your intake air temperatures. So an intercooler is essentially a radiator for the boosted air exiting your turbocharger. Just like a radiator cools the coolant that goes through your motor to keep it from melting, okay? The intercooler cools the air that's going into your motor to keep it from detonating and to give you the maximum amount of horsepower. Now from the factory, an RX-7 intercooler is pretty small. I mean, it's like this big, man, okay? And it doesn't do much, okay? Because it's so tiny, it heat soaks quickly. And from the factory, you'll find that the water-to-air intercooler systems on say like Ford Mustangs or Corvette ZR1s and stuff, they work pretty good until you've been on the throttle over and over and over. And then at a certain point, the 
water that's cooling those intercooler cores begins to saturate and heat soak and then you lose efficiency and you run into the same issue you have with an undersized uh, stock intercooler on an RX-7. So I think that, you know, a lot of people say, well, water to air intercooler sucks because it's going to heat soak the water. Okay. But it's important to, to note that we have to be comparing apples to apples. So a water to air intercooler is not any greater or worse when you're looking at stock systems versus each other. Okay. Now, if you go and you upgrade your stock intercooler to a big front mount core that sits in the front of your car, right in front of the radiator, okay? You're gonna cool the shit out of your intake air temperatures and it's gonna be amazing, okay? And it's obviously going to destroy a factory water to air intercooler system because, I mean, it's so much larger, so much more volume, it can extract so much more heat and it can allow you to compress so much more air and still maintain a nice temperature close to atmospheric uh, temperature. Okay, but you can do the same thing with a water to air system. It's just a little bit more complicated. Okay, with a water to air system, it's it's important that you keep the temperature of the water down, and to do so, uh, it requires a few things. So first of all, let's look at why would you ever consider a water to air intercooler system over an air to air intercooler system. So the great things about an air to air intercooler system is very simple: no moving parts. You take this intercooler core, you bolt it on the front of your car. Okay, you run some charge pipes to it. Basically, the only thing you have to be concerned about is making sure the hose clamps don't blow off and that your fabrication is nice. Okay, and then you got good airflow through it. Maybe you want to make sure you have an under tray so the air doesn't run under the intercooler. It actually goes through it and you're ready to go. You're driving down the street, air is going through it. You're cooling the intake charge temps. Everything's gravy. Okay, but the drawbacks is when you got an engine really big like the four rotor. Okay, and the four rotor needs a lot of airflow to the radiator. And when you have to have a radiator so big that you can't fit an intercooler as well up front, then you have a space problem. There's just not enough space to put the intercooler that you really need for the horsepower you're trying to make. I mean, you're going to have to have a four or five inch thick intercooler that's really freaking wide with some huge four inch pipes on an engine this large to try to cool that air down. And there's just not room unless you do it extensive modifications unless you do a v-mount and to do a v-mount on a car like this to have the radiator and the intercooler separated from each other and have adequate airflow to each one you would have to cut the firewall up move the engine back redesign the intake manifold to where it's really really low so that it'll fit under the trans tunnel i mean you'd have to do a lot of stuff right so in essence of space the amount of real estate available on the car water to air intercooler systems become amazing because with a water to air intercooler system you can have a smaller core size. You don't need a large core to support the same amount of cubic feet per minute in cooling capacity. You can get away with a core that's almost a quarter the size. Okay, so a thousand horsepower water to air intercooler is itty bitty compared to a thousand horsepower air to air intercooler. And so it was perfect for this RX-7. We were able to take the intake manifold of this car and basically construct the intake out of two water to air intercooler cores two 500 horsepower Garrett water to air intercooler cores stuck together with a throttle body and four runners coming out. That's what we can do with this, these little tiny things. And they support the same amount of horsepower as a big four inch thick front mount intercooler. So that's the advantage of water to air. Now, what are we going to do to keep it from heat soaking? What are we going to do to overcome those issues that people speak about? Okay. Which is where you heat soak the water after a few laps and you just can't uh, cool it anymore. Okay. We're going to put a really big reservoir in the back of the car. So we've added this three gallon reservoir to the trunk. Okay. This holds two to three gallons of water. And what this is going to do is it's going to give us capacity. So it's almost like the water heater at your house. Let's say you got a 20 gallon water heater at your house, right? Okay. A 20 gallon water heater, you might be able to take a few showers before you run out of hot water. But if you only had a two gallon water heater, you're going to run out of hot water halfway through the shower. So it's the same thing except in reverse with cold water. So by adding two extra gallons of water to the system, we're buying ourselves time on throttle. That might be a few extra laps before the temperatures begin to rise. It's almost like a buffer to keep us from having rapid increases in temperatures because we're able to keep the water temperatures stabilized. Okay, so that's very important. If you look at a factory, you know, Ford Mustang or something like that, Corvette ZR1, whatever, they don't come with these big reservoirs. And so a lot of people complain about the heat soak problem with water air intercooling, and they think that, oh, water air intercoolers suck because of the heat soak. Well, I have a friend with a Mustang that makes 800 horsepower. What did he do to solve the issue? He put a massive reservoir in the trunk, just like this car, three gallons, immediately solved the issue. 
Another thing you can do is increase the size of your lines and run a very robust pump. And what that's going to allow you to do is increase the efficiency even more because you're going to be able to get the hot water out and get the cold water up there quicker. Less pressure drop through the lines, more powerful pump. And if you want to buy even more time and be even more efficient, you add upgraded heat exchangers to the car. And on this particular car, we've got two heat exchangers behind the seats, and we've got one heat exchanger in the deck lid. It takes up almost the whole deck lid. And these are radiators, literally, that cool the water down that's cooling down the intercooler. So it sounds really complicated, but it's actually pretty simple, right? So we're able to remote mount the cooling locations to the trunk so that we're not blocking the front uh, radiator and we're not utilizing the front bumper. We can utilize the rear of the car to be able to cool down the intake charge of the, uh, of the engine. So that's the advantage to the water air intercooling. Another advantage is that you can also turn the pump on and off. On an air-to-air -air car, you're going to heat soak at the stoplight. Because that intercooler core is not getting any airflow, and the radiator is transmitting heat into that intercooler when you're sitting there at the stoplight running for 20, 30 minutes in stop and go traffic. And the only way you're going to cool that thing down, spray it down with water, or get moving on the highway for a few minutes. So you're going to see temperatures doing this up and down, depending on movement of the vehicle. Water to air intercooling, nice and stable and predictable. And if it's going to rise, it's going to rise very slowly. And that the amount of capacity of water in the system determines how quickly that's going to rise. And so one thing that you can do that's pretty cool is if you know you're going to be in traffic, turn the pump off. You're not going to be using boost when you're in traffic, right? You're going to be sitting there at the stoplight. Turn the pump off, save that cool water. And once you get running, you know you're going to use boost, turn the pump back on, cool the water or cool the intake down with the cool water. Do your runs, turn the pump back off. You can serve that cool water, just like you can serve the water at your house in your water heater. Same idea. And we found that after doing back-to-back -back runs on the dyno in a low airflow environment, especially considering the dyno fans are blowing on the front bumper, but we have NACA ducted rear coolers back here. No air is getting to that because the car's not even moving down the highway. We still had only 30 to 40 degrees over ambient temperature intake air, nice and stable. So that means if it was 90 degrees outside, we weren't seeing more than 120, 130 degrees Fahrenheit intake air temperatures. So the downside that I find on this particular application for a water to air is the fact that the intake manifold contains the intercoolers and it's mounted on top of this hot keg of an engine. And that causes a little bit of heat soak and reduces our efficiency just a little bit. So maybe we're closer to 30 to 40 degrees over ambient. Whereas in air to air, if you're cruising down the highway, maybe you'll get closer to 15 or 20 degrees over ambient. So we might run a few degrees hotter overall than you would be on an air to air. But the benefit is consistency, consistency, consistency. And in racing, everything is about consistency. You wanna have consistent brake pressure. You wanna have consistent tire pressure. You wanna have consistent steering angle. You wanna have consistent horsepower. You wanna have consistent temperatures, consistent intake air predictability, consistent timing, right? You don't wanna see your intake temperatures doing this. And so that's the beauty of the water to air intercooling system is that you're going to have predictability, consistency, and anytime you go out there and flip that pump on, you can know that you're going to see 30 to 40 degrees over ambient for the boost that you're running, right? Then we add E85 in on top of this, and now we totally eliminate all potentials of knock, and we're keeping a nice, stable intake air temperature. Car's reliable, and we have all this room up front dedicated to oil cooling and water cooling for the motor. We still have a small package design and we can drive this car around just like a two-rotor. So thank you guys for watching the video. I hope this clears up uh, some questions about water to air intercooling. Um, a lot of people keep asking me about this car. Where is the intercooler? Because you don't even see it. I hope this answers those questions. Thank you guys for following. Um, I love doing these little talks, and I hope you guys like my videos, okay? Um, I love doing this stuff, and you know we can't wait to get this car out on the track. And if any of you guys are interested in a water tear intercooler system, let me know. I got a bunch of friends that are actually running them on two rotors, three rotors. There's a lot of people out there doing it. You just don't really see them too often. They're not so common. But these are the rules. This is how you get it working. Lots of capacity. Okay. Nice pump. Big size lines. And you'll be happy, man. So thanks a lot. Um, thanks for subscribing. And we'll talk with you later.